Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well over here. I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm I'm hoping we can cut out this this fan noise here. I'm uh, trying to make sure that everything stays cool on my my rig. I uh, upgraded my backup drive. Well, upgraded it from a non-working backup drive to a working backup drive. So that, that's yeah. I know. Last episode, you were talking about getting a new backup drive. Yeah, I did end up getting it right after the the show recording. So that that got delivered uh, about a week ago. You you were making fun of it too. You said you you know it, it looks like this this one big eye just staring out at oh, you. Oh yeah, camera. Took that and ran with it, right? Because it looks like it looks like Hal from like two thousand one, A Space Odyssey. Okay, looks yeah. Almost exactly like that, except it's blue. So I couldn't exactly name it Hal because I have I've like naming conventions for everything. Like my previous yeah. my previous hard drive was named Bespin uh, because it was like my cloud backup. So I, I actually found out that there is. There are a couple sequels to 2001 A Space Odyssey, the book. So there's like 2010, and there's also like 3001. Mm -hmm. I did not know that, so I might try to, to pick those up and, and give them a listen, because I've never I never even heard about them, but I definitely want to, to read them. I've only heard the movie. I didn't even I didn't know there was a book. Oh, yeah. I didn't know there was uh, two more books. There's one more movie, because they did film two, 2010, the, okay. the sequel to 2001. Uh, but I don't think there was a third movie. I think it was only a, a third, third. Maybe it was like maybe a split into two, third and fourth book. Okay, How about that. <laughs> that you're naming uh, who Hal? <laughs> well, I was going to name it Hal, uh, but there is, and I'm gonna try not to spoil it. But there's an entity in the third book that is named Hal Man, and uh, so I, I I knew I couldn't name it Hal because it's not you know it doesn't have a red eye. Yeah. I haven't read the book, so hopefully. Hopefully Hellman has a blue eye. I'm, I'm going to hope or else I might have to rename this thing. But I don't know. It just it came to me. So it was four terabytes. And I guess I didn't really grok how big four terabytes was. Because obviously when you get a f new drive, the first thing you want to do is format it. And as a good sysadmin, you not only want to format it, you also want to zero it out. right? So, so I, I went to start writing it with all zeros. This really big bright light on the front of it. Uh, also blinks when you're writing to it. So it was this incessant blinking for hours and hours and hours and hours. So I had to like cover it up with my with my laptop, like put it in front of it so it wasn't like, it wasn't, you know, uh, super annoying while it was sitting there writing. So I'm like, okay, why is this taking so long? Because I gave it a solid like 24 hours and 30 hours and, and I came back and it was still writing. And I'm doing this through GNOME's, GNOME disks. Right, so like Linux's yeah. UI to, to write in it doesn't give you exactly like a progress bar or anything. So I'm like, all right, what is going on here? I'm surprised so you I, did that over like a DD, you know, input device, and then just writing out zeros to that thing. That would have been, that would've, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I've done that so often. For you often. to say you're doing the uh, GNOME UI, that is just that is. Just, are you okay? <laughs> well, first of all, let's let's make it clear. I'm running Cinnamon right now. I'm not running GNOME. <laughs> okay. So okay. that's that's totally. And I'm running Manjaro. So in Arch, I could have actually ran DD with the status equals progress flag, and I would have had a progress bar for myself on the command line. No, you know, I, I wouldn't have to think twice about it. But I'm sitting here like. Oh, I wonder how good the GUI is these days, you know, just going to try it out. And, and it's sitting here writing for like 24, 30 hours. I'm like, oh, what's going on? So I installed the IO top and I took a look at it and found out that it was only writing at about 20 megabytes a second. What? <laughs> so I, I did some quick back of the napkin math and, and figured out it was going to take almost like 60 hours for this thing to zero out my four terabyte disk. It's like this is this is ridiculous. There's no reason this should be the case. Oh, so I'm sitting there like, all right, what can I? What, what's what's going on? Because this this sh absolutely should not be the case. That's a slow and, right, slow right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm looking at how I have it plugged in, just trying to figure out, you know, is yeah, is something being stupid here? And I remembered that I had bought a USB extension that plugged in not to the PCI board but directly onto the motherboard, the other side. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Those are at USB 2.0 speed. 
that so, will do it. That, that, that will do it. Exactly. Yeah. So it's writing super slow. So I'm like, oh, okay. Let me plug it into the you know USB 3.0 socket, and it went faster, but it only went about twice as fast. So I'm sitting there at like 40, 45 megabytes per second. Like, wh what's going on? And figured out there's a certain type of technology that's like a, a single layer versus double layer or something like that. Anyways, the hard drive that's in this thing is like half as fast as it should be. And Seagate's kind of pushing these things under the door, uh, you know, because people aren't exactly testing you know, their, their hard drive write speed, they just plug it in and, you know, it works and it's as fast as it really is, right, period. So I'm sitting here like, I got this crap 4 terabyte hard drive. It's it's not crap, you know. I'm, I'm sitting here, I got this, I get this hard drive that that is really suboptimal. If I had it in my NAS, I would be upset there. Like, if I had gotten a, a legit WD red or something and got stuck with this technology, then yeah, I'd, I'd be a little upset. Uh, but this being just my backup for my desktop, um, I'm literally just writing to this during the night. So like, I don't care exactly how long it takes. Yeah, it's it's not. It doesn't need to be a speed demon. It's not serving up media. It's not doing anything. It's just kind of holding backups, and and that's fine for me. And that and that and that boosted it. It, it took ugh, probably because I stopped it right in the middle. I you know I kind of was like what, what? Well, I had to because I had to switch ports. So it, it took me like another 20 hours for it to actually zero out. Uh, but once once that got done, it was formatted, uh, Lux encrypted, of course. It's, it's working pretty good. I think that's hilarious that it's 20 meg a 20 megabyte, right? Well, should we jump into it here? Uh, yeah, there's there's a, a, a something I wanted to touch on uh, going, catching up from last week um, about Firefly 3. And this is just what I've been dabbling in and, and some of the, the cool stuff that that's hopefully coming soon with dynamically uh, set default admin passwords and stuff like that. I, I had to dive into Firefly 3 to look at the API and, and stuff like that. And I came across a, a, a really interesting thing that I had actually known before but forgot to, to look into it. So it, it says in the documentation that when registering, Firefly 3 uses the Have I Been Pwned Password API, V3, to verify if you're using a secure password. You also have the ability to disable this when registering an account. Uh, so I, I thought that was really cool. It's it's one of the, the ways, and I know before we had talked about Firefly 3 implementing telemetry, that plus this Have I Been Pwned integration, I, I think it's really making use of the broader ecosystem pretty well to to have these added layers of security on top of it making sure that you know um the have i been pwned is or well added layers of functionality right so integrating with the have i been pwned is, is security right implementing with telemetry is useful actionable feedback uh, for development and, and i i think it's doing a really good job doing that and as you said last time i mean you you can see that from the ui it's just really clean and sleek and yeah so I thought that was that was cool. It was notable, at least I thought. And, and I just something I stumbled across, and and it made me take a step back and say, "Oh, that's that's neat." You know. Should we get into uh, community news and updates? I saw one down here that I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, there there's there's plenty here. The first one I have is the Matrix team welcoming Gitter to their ecosystem. So. Uh, Gitter is a chat platform for communities who are using Git for version control. Um, it has notable hooks into GitHub and probably GitLab as well. So this chat platform is something that is used to discuss pull requests, to discuss code changes and code review. They've made the decision to host their backend on Matrix. Element, the company, is working on integrating the matrix technology into uh, Gitter and, and, and integrating that everywhere it is. And they have a, a couple, uh, several steps that they're going to use, uh, including first like doing, doing bridging. Well, w bridging already exists, right? So you can always bridge between the two networks. Um, they're going to 
take a couple steps to migrate onto the new Matrix backend. And eventually, with an eye on moving Gitter completely into Element. In, in, in fact, really merging the two projects. Um, I, I believe at this point they've said that that UI right is eventually going to become Element. Right, it is. Oh, okay. Element yeah, is awesome. going to be, yeah, is, is going to yeah. absorb all the features. Make sure you hit feature parity, right? So they're going to focus on all the features that Gitter has right now. Get that up to feature parity, and then insert elements where Gitter is currently. Um, I was very, very happy to see this. That means we're going to be onboarding a lot of people onto Matrix um, as well. There were a couple new servers just deployed onto Matrix, which I I thought was fascinating. So. The first was Jupyter Broadcasting are now running a matrix server. And let's see if I can pull it up here. So there is, so it is matrix.jupyterbroadcasting.com is their server for Linux Unplugged and all of their other shows. Um, so they are, they are on here. They're running their own server. They do federate with matrix.org. Uh, so, so I'm actually using my matrix.org account to hop on their server and access their channels. So it's it's fairly seamless. I'm I'm very happy with it. I, I think they're actually using Linode to host their VPS that's running this. They they set it up uh, right before one of the shows and then like reset it up and like haven't taken it down yet. They're they're completely in love with it. Uh, and then LRN, uh, the Liberty Radio Network. Uh, they host Free Talk Live and have since the 90s. They had recently got kicked off of Discord because one of their moderators apparently went rogue, kicked all of their members, and subsequently reported like all of their channels. Like he he was he was not happy. He he went complete berserk mode. So he has. Uh, They've they've lost all of their access on Discord. Their quote unquote Discord server, which we all know isn't a server. It's just you know and whatever. It's a subset of you know. It's almost like a subdirectory. But so they've lost access to that, and they decided to spin up a matrix server. So they're they're hoping they they love the idea. Obviously, they're they're big into liberty, uh, open source, and and freedom and stuff like that. So. They, they are loving the concept of a matrix. And we're two years ago, I wouldn't have said that, you know, Vector or Riot, whatever it was back there, was ready for prime time. I think the one thing that brought it up to par with everything else was the reactions, like the, the thumbs up, the smiley face and all that, right? It, it, it was just something on the roadmap that they had to work towards and they finally got there. And I'm like, dude, dude you guys are nailing it. They're, they're really blowing it out of the water. So anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy with the project and, um, I'm still looking at, I, on my, on my Camboard instance, I've got a to do item to bridge an instance with uh, group me so that I can, I can do that. Cause a lot of the people I'm in constant contact with, especially, you know, through, through church or just community, it group me is the easiest way because everyone has SMS. Actually, there was an XKCD about that. Did you, did you see it? It was like no. last week sometime there was like, there was like privacy preserving applications, right? On, it was like a Venn diagram, right? So there's sure, privacy yeah. preserving applications in the top right of three circles. Uh, next to it was uh, good UI, uh, clients in in the circle next to it and below it at the very bottom all by itself was was clients that everyone has and it was just sms right there like text <laughs> i mean it's so true though <laughs> everyone has a has a you know number to text from it's like all right yeah <laughs> you know it's it's, I'm, gonna have find, I'm gonna have to find that one and add it to the show notes. Oh, it's great! It's it's great. Are we gonna have an image of the week? We might we might start having images of not unofficial images of the week. We'll, we'll try it out. Yeah, but that was yeah. I I, I thought that was really cool. But I, you know, I'm I'm totally down to push matrix riot element vector whatever they're calling it these days. Uh, it's it's just really really well done. Um, I'm I'm so happy to see them keep keep pushing forward with it. Uh, that was a long take on what should have been a short news item. Uh, this one hopefully will be even shorter. This is more of an I told you show. So Todoist, and if you don't know what Todoist is, it's a, another productivity application. It's like an Evernote-ish 
mixed with a you know to-do list system with tagging and you know one of its one of its claims to fame is it uses like natural language processing so you can say like in two weeks and it would you know put a reminder on your calendar two weeks yeah later. or right. with jared and it would tag you know J- whoever jared yeah, is. how fancy yeah sure yeah. yeah so it has that that fun kind of natural language processing but recently they have switched to using, well, not switched to using, but started to integrating Kanban-style boards, right? Yeah, they, they don't say that it's better or, you know, the, the reason why they integrated this. I can only assume with this kind of monumental change from a to-do list-based system to a board-based system that they found some incredible value in that. It, the value that I found, the value that I hope everyone can find, in in using these kind of visual board representations rather than to-do lists. And, and, you know, this is just reinforcing my spiel that, look, using, using to-do lists is great, right? But it has major drawbacks that need to be heavily com- compensated for. I, right. I think boards do away with the biggest of those drawbacks and actually implement a couple other ancillary features that you wouldn't even think about were you to have not planned that out beforehand if you didn't see it right exactly so so you know this is more so a, and i told you so than anything else uh but i was just i was like okay a to-do list app switching to a board driven app i can get behind that so cool to see the industry moving in that direction um, and then the next one is Ohio Linux Fest. Is this the one you were talking about, Jack? Yeah, that this you were excited is the one I was for? excited about. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 So this week, this this year, Ohio Linux Fest is coming up. They're doing it online. Was the big news item for me that I saw. It's supposed to be November fifth through seventh. Says our content has not been solidified, but these are the dates we're targeting. Call for presentations is open. If you have a talk you'd like to provide, please submit it by October tenth. That's actually coming up here. Yeah. So registration just opened. Uh, is what I'll say. It opened. Friday the 2nd, basically watch your email. I, I don't know why they do this, but they send the link via text. And I think it goes back to that XKCD where everyone has SMS. So it's interesting the way they do it. Wait, why, why, why do you need tickets if it's virtual? So I have a ticket. I, I haven't looked at it yet. I, I assume they're going to send a link to the presentations and then you can just hop on. So I don't know, it'll be interesting. What do we have here? Ohio Linux Fest Institute programming is actively being worked on. We will update everyone as the content is being added. And then they also attach a survey here uh, with a new virtual format. We want to make sure that we're tailoring the content as well as we can for those who are planning on attending. And then uh, in the show notes here, we also have a, subs- a way to subscribe and ch- to check out the information. I see that subscribe to the Ohio Linux attendees and it's the uh, it looks like it's mail a mailing list there. Yeah, so I'm 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 very interested to see how they handle this. Obviously, this is kind of where the entire industry is going, the the direction it's going in. So, uh, and then one very very last news item uh, that I put on here was uh, podcasts that are on IPFS. This is this is a lot of decentralization going on today, uh, but but I thought it was pretty cool. So pod.casts.io is a ClearNet gateway to IPFS that is an aggregator of all of the podcasts that are stored on IPFS. So just using the interplanetary file system, um, all of these these podcasts are hosted on there, and this is the aggregator. I, I, I guess it's the first aggregator that's really undertaken the, uh, the, the task of categorizing and cataloging them all. So... Um, I gotta find out what it's gonna take to get us on there. Uh, I That's haven't, awesome. I haven't... Yeah, I'm looking at it. I thought the news item was that we were on there. No. I thought it was under our composed developments for a second. I was like, no way we're on IPFS. That's awesome. <laughs> but then I, I, I'm seeing it now and I'm hearing it. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> so that's Not definitely yet. something to look forward to, though. I so I checked out that list, that link. It's a direct. Uh, it's everything that's curated, and it's there's a decent amount of stuff on there. There's absolutely. I was expecting to be pretty slim, and there's like there's, they have all kinds of stuff out there. All right, and, and that is really all we have for the community news. There's only one development uh, of our Compose that I wanted to highlight, uh, and that's Nginx hardening. Uh, so there were a couple more parameters that I set in our proxy. 
Uh, that just got us an A plus score on SSL Labs. Um, yeah, yeah, two huge thumbs up. Super happy about that. Yeah. Uh, SSL Labs, if if you're unaware, is uh, or SSL Labs, if anyone is unaware, is a site that will rate the security uh, of your website. Um, just it'll it'll ping. It'll do a whole bunch of tests. It'll do handshakes. It'll do it'll attempt exploits and and uh, let you know whether you're vulnerable or not to various things uh, and, and kind of rate the, the site as it pertains to the security and functionality of the website. So super happy to A plus on there and hopefully we can, we can keep that up. So happy, happy to see that uh, and, and, and get that, get that result back. Just making sure we're doing the right thing here. The A plus is the extra step there. I'll tell you yeah, what, cause it, I, it's, it's easy to get the A with just the cert but you have to take, there's a couple extra steps there to get that A plus. So, and it's really easy too. Cause they'll give you, if not a page about the remediation, they'll at least give you the keywords that you need to know in order to go remediate that. And yeah, honestly, there are so many people using it that a quick Google search or quick DuckDuckGo search will provide you any kind of info you need on, uh, how do I implement this policy that they say I need? And it's like right at your fingertips. So, Super happy about that. Yeah, should we jump into the integration discussion here? I'm, I know I'm, I'm excited for it. I know I know you probably have a lot to say on uh, this week's uh, topic, which is Run Deck. I don't necessarily know where I want to take it, but I know I want to take it somewhere. So let's let's dive in and, and see right. where it goes. So Run Deck is per the official documentation, okay. Run Book Automation. Give anyone self service access to the operations capabilities that previously. Only your subject matter experts could perform. Popular use cases include incident management, business continuity, service requests, or just spreading the operational load among your colleagues. Most server administration is done with either one of two things. Either it's done in the AD GUI, ADUC, or it's yep. done in uh, command line scripts, right? And, and, you know, sysadmins. I mean, we, as long as it works, it's good enough. Oh, is it? Well, okay. Let me walk that back. As long as it works and it's documented, <laughs> it's good enough. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and, and those two steps, I think are the prerequisites to creating an automation front end. Well, or, or to using effectively using an automation front end. And I, I like to have this mental picture in my mind of of levels of automation almost three concentric circles right with with the innermost uh, being what you were talking about that that scripting or or that that understanding of if i have this issue or i run into this scenario or i need to do this then there is a script to be run right, right. obviously those scripts take time to develop you know there are subject matter experts that need to put those together that need right. to to make sure that they're maintained and stuff. So, so you have that core and, and sometimes it's just, it's just a simple command or it's like a, it's a three step process where you have to uh, take, take three actions to get to the end result. Right. So, so that's kind of the core of automation. Automation is, is not complicated. It's not a huge buzzword as, is I'm sure you're going to go into later, but all it, all it is, is, is simply knowing what to do when, and then putting some kind of, uh, automation around what to do. Would you say some trigger around what to do? Actually, that's put, th yeah, because I heard you say put automation around automation. And I yeah, yeah, I'd that's clear, true. That's just true. clarify that. Yeah, put put like a, a a trigger or a framework around that. You know, some some kind of way that that manages the processes that other would otherwise would be kicked off manually, right? right? So so how do we manage those being kicked off, right? And on the other side of it, right? So, so skipping skipping the the middle circle, right? So, so the 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 larger circle, the the thing that you can only have once everything else is fully formed, is automated remediation or orchestration, where there is a a series of events that self correct, right? Or or self balance or. Or, or keep everything aligned, kind of, kind of the magic that DevOps is supposed to perform, right? So, so you have that orchestration that is, that is kind of 
managing everything else, all of the lower level aspects of the day-to-day operations of what you're doing as a systems yeah. administrator. Um, in the middle is is some kind of automation front end where you want to encapsulate your scripts or processes that can can be kicked off and managed from a central location. And sure. yeah. th- that's it's important for several reasons, right? The the first one is sharing between people, right? Cuz you you obviously if I run a command line on a script, the only way that I'm going to be able to share that output with with someone is taking a screenshot and then forwarding it over to them, right? And the most frustrating thing I ran into was we have all of our coworkers running on disparate systems with different environments, the same scripts, and you're getting different outcomes. That should never, ever, ever be the case, right? How about that? That's pretty interesting that you have that playing out like that. Yeah, especially if I'm running from one server and then someone else is running from a jump host and then someone's running locally on what you're operating on, you're going to get three different results. If a script is written to only operate on the host that it's being run on, you can't run it remotely, right? right. I mean, so so if you try to do that, you're going to mess everything up. And, and if I had just told them, well, just run the script, right? Um, that may not have been enough information, probably a documentation fault on my end, but it... it it wasn't. It didn't have those bumpers that is that are crucial in working in a team. Like like we're obviously you want to communicate and, and be be in, in in contact with each other and, and kind of keep keep passing information back and forth and and working in tandem. But having an automation front end puts a a guideline puts guidelines in front of. You know what is actually expected when you run this, especially when it comes to like what information is needed for these scripts, right? So that's right. that's another thing. Not only not only do do the scripts need to be run, right? But like what is optional to run the script, and you know what is needed. And obviously, scripts usually, if they're well written, have error handling built into them if a necessarily parameter isn't passed or or something of that sort, right? However, the the process to get there can be super frustrating if i start to run a script and it asks me for another piece of information i'm like oh, okay now i gotta go look that up and pull it in put it in there run it again oh i need this other piece of information right yeah. if i knew that up front i could go get everything i needed plug it in run it i'm and done done right yeah right. I'm done. rather that than saves... oh i need one more parameter oh well i need one more parameter oh well i need you know it you just exactly. turn into going on going on a big search for everything exactly. rather than knowing what's it right in front of you at the time or yeah, knowing so, what so, you need right there. So it, that even makes it easier to share with other people. If you say, hey, I wrote a script. You're like, great. Can it run like on my local computer? You're like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Right. So this, this puts a framework around it that says, okay, here's the environment that it's set up in. Here are the parameters that it needs right in front of you. I can, I, and I've had, I've had a wild success with putting people in front of what we use uh, at, at my own job and saying, you know, here's, here's the front end, right? Uh, can you run it for me? And and they'll spend a couple of minutes kind of poking around and say, oh, oh, I, I, I need a server list. Oh, I, I can do that. You know, you can grab a server and, and paste it in. Oh, okay. Well, what environment is this? Well, uh, this is the development environment. Oh, it's a drop down, and I can select the yeah. development environment, right? And uh, oh, there's a there's a big go button or, or run button right there. I can yeah. I can click that. Oh, oh, it's running. Oh, that's <laughs> you know and. And it's 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 very intuitive to work out. I think that's a nice necessary feature of automation front ends as well. Is is that it has an intuitive, intuitive. It's intuitive. Yeah. 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 That's absolutely. That's the key word there because you can just look at it and anyone can figure it out. Anyone can say, oh well, I need to apply patches. Okay. Oh, this is the patching folder, the patching script. All right. What month? You know, what month is it? All right. It looks like it's October. So we'll run the October patches because and what servers do I want to apply to? Oh. Our development servers and another do- drop down you know anyone can figure it out if they know what they're doing they, exactly. they don't have and to know what they're doing they don't have to know what they're doing that's the that's the nice part about it being intuitive it just works anyone could do it you want to give them an intuitive interface because you know it's it's easy to call people stupid or you know it's 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 easy to get frustrated with coworkers when they're not used to your workflow right and and sure, it works sure. for you and Absolutely. it doesn't work for them 
right? And this is this is a great equalizer because they don't need to know everything you do about how you set everything up. If you're able to make it run in that automation front end, then they will as well. Like that's that's what makes right. it so Jeez. beautiful. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and also a lot of these automation front ends of which Run Deck is is probably my favorite is that they generally have an API that can be used, right, yeah. programmatically. So once I've once I've started defining those like inputs, once I've started defining those variables that I need in order to run the script, I can make an API call to that from some kind of outside tool and this is where we start getting to talk about the the orchestration and the the real magic, the real kind of cool stuff. That can make calls to my automation front end and run those programs, run those scripts, run those commands like I would. Right? And sure. and there's a benefit to this as well that it provides me a front end and it provides me an API because you could just say, okay, why can't the orchestration just run? You could say, why can't the orchestration just you can say, why can't the orchestration just run when I need it to run? Why does it have to go through the front end API? Why can't it just talk to the servers? And and it probably can. But the problem there then is, well, how do you get your script from manually running it and, and making sure it works all the time, which orchestration really does need, works repeatedly in, in a deterministic fashion? How do you get it from... How do you get it to there so that the orchestration can then come in and work with that script? You don't have to worry about it, right? And right. the way you do that is by constant testing. Now, you can set up automated testing, and that's something else that automation front ends can, can work on where you have this API. You can run, like, nightly tests, and you can have a test suite, and you can you can kind of craft all this around. But nothing is going to beat having your coworkers go in and making making all of the little the little issues, right? And you're like, oh, well, I, I didn't even think of that, right? So you, you add another condition in there. You, you're you able to tweak your automation and then you run it over and over and over and over and over again through this front end. You have everyone else running it through this front end. You get a very robust set of scripts or commands at the end of that. You have a, you have a really good process that is nailed down and that you feel confident in to then put into a, a broader process. Or, or here's the other thing you can do. If not orchestration, you can hand it off to someone who is maybe not necessarily as technically inclined. Like Rundex Overview states that you can give ex anyone self-service access to the operations capabilities that previously only your subject matter experts could perform. And, you know, Jack, you're... You're more expensive per, per hour than someone who doesn't have your knowledge, right? Who doesn't sure. necessarily uh, have your skills. But you don't need your skills in order to grab rudimentary information and plug it into a front end and hit a button, right? Right. We all know that, you know, SOCs or NOCs or, or general operations centers, they love having buttons, right? They have buttons to push and fields to fill out. They feel good. They have their their bumpers. They have their bowling lane bumpers, right? You, they don't have to worry about having too many variables or, or, or too many uh, unknowns thrown at them, right? They can. It's it's very easy for someone who is trying to start learning this to make make a actual difference right off the bat, right? This is right. this is where you're getting the best bang for your buck when it comes to these these uh, people who are just learning, who are trying to onboard, you know, you can you can really uh, have them return value to you immediately if you're able to give them something like this. Yeah, whereas... they ha I really like the uh, bumper analogy. It's you're with you're stuck. You're stuck. You're it, it's a good thing that they're stuck because otherwise they'd be hunting around for parameters on these scripts or where are the scripts or where's the documentation for the script with the. Uh, automation front end you basically sign in and you say well i need to do this oh it looks like someone already wrote a job to do that or a uh function to do that i'm just going to use what's already out there yeah you it don't certainly have to beats be, an email you know, back and forth to say you know right. what what do i need to run this well you need these parameters well where do i find those parameters well, you know and you can have yeah, the documentation for right, yeah right yeah so i i i i think it could be ridiculously useful for that case and not only with you know lower level operation centers but with other areas of expertise so for instance uh i have a, a script that gives pseudo access for our monitoring team 
right? But it's limited in that it only accepts one user. It's only the functional user, and it's only the pseudo permissions that that functional user should have access to on any of our given servers. So, so the problem is if that server was overlooked or if those pseudo permissions were deleted or, or something for some reason went sideways, right? They now have a script to run that lets them do exactly what they're allowed to do without having to open a ticket to us. Right. That is ridiculously cool, right? Because well, even though it's- It saves you guys time. Yeah, it, it saves yeah. us time and it saves us goodwill because we're allowing them to do their job. We're empowering them to do exactly what they need to do without having to get bogged down in the technicalities of, you know, I, I need these pseudo permits. Well, on which servers, you know, it saves a lot of back and forth. So I'm I, I was really happy to, to do that. And and that's a That's a different kind of, of bumpers to give them. You know, I'm, we're able to give them just what they need, like a, right? Just what they're a allowed. Self-service, right. Like a self-service center type thing there. Rather than taking up your guys' time on their own, you know, back and forth on reaching out and finding someone available, they could just go in and say, well, I need this access. And it's there for them. It's already there for them. And to to paraphrase a, a movie very poorly, the age of the ticket is over. The age of self-service has just begun. There is there's no better way I, I think to, to get goodwill than to give someone to empower someone to say, Hey, you can do it. You know, that that even <laughs> feels good to hear, even if I'm not talking to you. You're like, you can do it. You're like, Oh oh really? That's that's awesome, right? I'm like Yeah, I've you know, here's here's what I'm able to give you and, 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 and you can do it yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to put in a ticket. You know, we don't have to go through a paperwork rigmarole. Let's yeah. just get you the ability to do what you need as quick as possible. So, um, run deck is a, one implementation of an automation front end. I'm not going to get into what I don't play around with right now. Cause it, it has a, a whole bunch of different things from what it can connect to. Um, it's claim to fame is that it is, built to replace those scripts just those scripts that need to be run on specific servers or at specific times or with specific parameters it has really been built to be as flexible as possible with you know whatever connections that are necessary in order to go out and and run exactly as you would as a regular logged in user there's a there's a breakdown here that i put uh, of the essential concepts and and I kind of wanted to go over how run deck breaks itself down uh, especially in terms of, of how we use it at our compose so there are several fundamental concepts that underlie and drive the run deck system if you're a new user knowing about them will help you use or integrate run deck into your environment fair enough um, so here we have projects and jobs, I think, are the two biggest ones, followed up with nodes and commands, execution, ACLs, and plugins. So I'm not necessarily going to talk about plugins uh, or nodes in depth, but I wanted to go into to some of those other ones. Uh, first of all, projects are probably the... Well, projects are the first thing you see when you log into Rundeck, and projects are groupings of jobs it, the, the description here is a project is a place to separate management activity all run deck activities occur within the context of a project and multiple projects can be maintained on the same run deck server so it is literally a just a container uh, in which you can manage who has access to what jobs and we'll get into that later when it comes to the acls uh, and then then jobs themselves are a sequence of steps job options, and nodes where the steps execute. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here talking about jobs. Jobs are fairly flat in the hierarchy of projects. There's there's not a whole lot that gets shared among jobs. Uh, there, it's, it's, it's virtually flat where everything is kind of presented to you all at once. Now, there is a way to nest it and kind of give it a directory structure per se, but there's there's not a whole lot that you would do in there that wouldn't be better done in projects. And I, I think a lot of what is going to be granted as far as permissions go is going to be done at the projects level rather than the job level. So jobs aren't necessarily for permissions as, as to who can run or do what on a job. It's, it's more like what is, what is the actual automation that I want to implement? And 
a job runs several steps through connections and, and connections are going to be SSH, right? They're going to be WinRM. Uh, they're going to be a connection to AD. They're going to be connection to Kubernetes. The, you know, the run deck, like I said, kind of branches out to, to all of these. They, they, they make an effort to work with all kinds of connections that it can latch on to, to actually execute uh, processes, right? So it's, it's going to have something that it can use to, to run what you need it to run. For the most part, I mean, Jack and I are, are familiar with, with CLI commands. So, so that's, that's pretty much what we use it to run. And we run CLI commands on the local server. So, so obviously, Rundeck is installed on a server. It has its user that it, it runs jobs as. And that user can run CLI commands like anything else. Um, and since Ansible is a CLI command, Ansible Playbook specifically, we use that functionality to run all of our Ansible commands. Now, now the cool thing is I have the entire server to play around with, right? So I'm storing stuff in temp, right? I'm using, well, not right now, but I could if I needed to use NFS mounts, right? I can do anything on a server that I could normally and just have this basically GUI front end on top of it that runs the commands on the local server that I need to. Uh, now, it does have additional functionality where it can reach out to another server over SSH and execute commands there. Um, it can sudo to other users. It can do, you know, however you need it to. And I think this is where Rundeck really shines is that the level of granularity uh, of, of how you can get stuff to run is just mind boggling, right? Because there, there are no restrictions other than what you can already do on a server anyways. Yeah, I really like that jobs because you can set up multiple steps in your job and you're going to have to correct me on this. So I, is it multiple job? It's it's one job, but it's different steps in that job. Different steps, exactly. You know, projects are definitely the place to organize where you're going to put, you know, uh, different context. So obviously for us, I think of the example being our test environment, which is very bare versus what we use in production. And then we have our, you know, deploy instance, for example, is that job. But in that job, we have multiple steps and within those steps, they're running multiple different scripts rather than just calling, thinking of a job as a script, as one monolith script, it's able to do multiple things there. Yeah. And, and that makes it a lot easier to code these, these little one-off scripts and say, well, I just need this one script to do this one thing. Uh, and then combine that with a couple other steps. And then instead of writing documentation as, as to go to the server, run this one thing, go to this other server, run the second thing, and then wait for this to come up. And then, you know, you can, you can automate that with this front end as a series of steps that it, it runs down and it executes. Um, and it has the regular error handling, um, which for me is actually a little bit lacking. Uh, I would I would like it to be a little bit more unified, a little bit more abstracted from the actual specific step itself. But then again, I, I haven't really had a call to uh, dive deep down into it and, and, and abstract it away. It, everything that I'm, I'm doing has a error handling, but basically the error handling is clean up the server and then fail. So it's, sure. it's not exactly like it's, it's orchestrating itself, which I'm okay with. Because at this point, right, if I wanted to orchestrate stuff, I would abstract that to a higher level and say, all right, let's 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 get something else that interacts with my automation front end that also interacts with other services like monitoring. It, like it could be in itself a monitoring software that actually orchestrates the remediation of issues uh, through Rundeck. But if, if you don't need something like that, you just need automation front end, then, then Rundeck is going to be the front end to handle all that work. So um, now, of course, this this means that you're you, the person who is working with Rundeck, who's setting Rundeck up, they're going to be the subject matter expert. They're going to know where the scripts are. They're going to be running the scripts. They're probably going to be maintaining the scripts too. Right? Um, however, this, once it's set up, can be handed off to whoever needs to uh, have access to those scripts for instance you know let's let's take ourselves so we we have jobs within rundeck to uh, spin up a new environment to fully deploy a new server and to fully tear down a server right and those are yeah. those are ansible scripts that i think i've talked about previously but 
having put them into run deck, I mean, either Jack and I can run them, right? Not only that, we can also run them with the correct access. For instance, we have the secrets and and passwords and, and, and other different authentication mechanisms stored within run deck. So it has a way to securely store passwords, right? So then I don't have to go in and put a password in every time. As long as I'm logged in as myself and I have permission to run that, it already knows what password it needs to authenticate, what API token it needs to authenticate to these various services. So it, it can do that for us. Or, you know, it, in, in real, realistically, our case, it is simply holding the password to the uh, environment that it needs to unlock in, in order to get to that, uh, get to those passwords, to those API tokens that it needs. Right. So, so either way, it's still... Of it's it, it's a way for me to securely hold that password without having to keep on putting it in time and time again, or or even worse, put it in over the command line and have that in my history. Right? right. It's right. definitely a more secure way of executing sensitive commands. Yeah, those ACLs. I know. I I don't know if you said you're going to touch on them at all or not, but you can go over them with a fine tooth comb. You, you the way the granularity that you get with those ACLs is just mind boggling compared to. So, you know, run deck gives you that you have your SME that builds it and maintains sure those scripts, but then you can say, all right, I need my monitoring team to have access to add themselves to this group, but I only need them to have some permissions, which gives them that ability rather than seeing a full blown view of everything. They're only able to run their job. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's where it shines. Um, I am interested to dive into run deck. I think I'm going to keep this overview pretty short. Um, cause there, there is a, a lot deeper that I could dive into here, but I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to save it so okay. that I can really drill down into some of the functionality that it provides. Okay. Um, the, the, the coolest thing though, that I haven't touched that I'm getting ready to, that I'm excited to is the plugin system, which is literally can be literally writing scripts that run deck executes as regular modules so instead of me having to write the command out every single time it has a a pre-baked script that i can have that automatically prompts you for the the parameters that it needs or or fills in and, and does the air handling on the back end oh okay that's awesome yeah yeah that's pretty cool because um, because right now i mean we're we're literally just using raw commands uh over and over and over again to to sure. run these these scripts because that's all we need honestly i just need a front end for ansible you and I didn't have to sit down and write an API. And that's kind of where I think it fills our need is you and I didn't have to sit down and write, all right, this HTTP request, we have to authenticate ourselves, and we need it to do this. Yeah. Otherwise we would, cause, cause right now we use run deck as a command and control server that portal and command center run jobs from, because that's our, that's a central callback, you know, command and control server that it, it authenticates to, and it, it runs jobs from because we know that's that's exactly how we need it to be, right? We're running those jobs manually, and then Portal on the back end is calling it. I mean, we're 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 testing these over and over and over again frequently, um, trying to move at a fast pace. So we're able to to have that functionality over an API rather than uh, having a, a manual command to log into a, a command and control server. server right? This right, is right. this is our front end that drives our automation, hence. My catchphrase, automation front end. So <laughs> I, I think Rundeck does a really good job of it, and I am interested to dig into it. Did you have anything else you wanted to add the interfaces or talk touch more on? I know I see the three there, the one more I would add. So the three I'm looking at, uh, if you're following along or not, uh, we have, he has web, web GUI, uh, command line interface, and the API. The one more I'd add, I, I don't know if I'd call it an interface, but they, they have their web hooks. I don't know if I'd call it an interface, but you can run a job manually. And then that webhook sends off a web request. I won't call it an API request. It sends off a web request to an external system. And from there, you're able to collect even more information that we, we do use that, especially in, so command center uses that to make calls out and then it receives a call back and then it makes another call out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in this case, command center is almost acting as our orchestration tool. 
uh, orchestrating the, the different subsequent runs and, and handling the failures as it needs to uh, through Rundex API. So I, I'm sure there's something I'm missing here. I was actually thinking about, I, I did a similar type talk for work on the, the system that we use there, the quick build, but I, I don't think I'm missing anything big. I'll, I'll circle back to it if I need to touch on something. Sounds good. I, I think trailing right off right off of run deck and front end automation, you, you, we get into DevOps here. I have a lot of fancy quotes that really I think don't mean anything, but I'm gonna list off anyway. And then uh, I do kind of want to talk about what DevOps is and actually how we, how I feel like we use it. So jumping into grab bag here, DevOps. I'll read it all. I'll read off the Gartner quote. DevOps represents a change in IT culture, focusing on rapid IT service delivery through the adoption of agile, lean practices in the context of a system oriented approach. DevOps emphasizes people and culture, and it seeks to improve collaboration between operations and development teams. DevOps implementations utilize technology, especially automation tools that can leverage an increasingly programmable and dynamic infrastructure from a life cycle perspective. So are you saying that I need to hire some DevOps team, like a DevOps team? No, 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 no. I, I love it. Uh, you're jumping, you're jumping here. You're jumping me, uh, uh, jumping the gun. Uh, do okay, I need to hire okay. a DevOps team? Uh, no, because I want to cover two things really quick here. Very, okay, go very for quick. it. Go for it. The one that was, thing that was a lot of that was a lot of buzzword bingo there. Yeah, it absolutely was. So I, I the way I look at DevOps is breaking it down two ways. It's uh, it's gonna sound it's a cheap answer, but it's breaking down the silos between development teams and operation teams, which that's where the word comes from. It's the for me, it's the the, the two important things are you build it, you run it. So you, actually your dev, your developers are taking more of an interest in the maintenance of the application than handing it over to the ops team and saying, all right, here it is. Here you go. Here's our artifact. Take it and run with it. You guys know what to do from here. It's them taking more of an interest in that life cycle. And then it's also the operations team managing more of their infrastructure in an automated way. So there's a resilient way to test infrastructure not you're not just testing applications you're saying okay well what happens if we take down five of our servers right now and they're all critical what happens do we have anything in place to keep them up or do we have anything in place to bring them back online what does that look like and it's so i think it's that development team taking a little bit more of the operations role and the operations role going in a programmatic way to build their infrastructure and their fit you know physical you know storage whatever they need so that's the way i look at it there are there are four kind of practices that I really like. Uh, infrastructure automation, which kind of hits that operations team. You have that continuous integration, continuous delivery, which both fall under, I would put it under the de development team. And then you have continuous monitoring, which I would also kind of toss under the operations team. Now, depending on how big your team size is, that could be one person managing that, like you and me. Like... <laughs> doing that stuff or it could be you know you have one team managing the application side and you have another team managing the infrastructure side infrastructure automation i feel like we went over a decent amount with run deck i feel like it's describing your infrastructure and its configuration as a script or set of scripts at environments that can be rep replicated in a much less error prone manner so the main tools ansible terraform i'm trying to think some of the other infrastructure automate you know Puppet they're, they're out yeah, Puppet Chef. Uh, a lot of YAML is what I think of when I think infrastructure Co automation. Yeah, C Kubernetes if you're getting into the uh, orchestration of containers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's out there. Infrastructure automation is more your sysadmin and operations team role is what I would, where I'd put it. It's kind of on them to make sure that infrastructure is, stays online, is, is resilient, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the continuous in integration and delivery, I would say are put more on that development team and they're taking on that operations role where they're saying, all right, we have changes that we made to the code base and we're merging it into the master branch. What happens now? Do we manually test or is there some, is there, is there tooling we can use to automate everything? And that integration is kind of falls under that te automated testing suite rather than saying and sending it over to a QA team and being like having them, well, I entered my username and it didn't work or I entered a password and it didn't work. It's like, why isn't this, you, you have to ask yourself, why isn't this automated? And if it's failing, don't merge it. If it's passing, if the build is passing, I'll say merge it in. So what is, what does that mean for, for development teams 
And then what does that mean for operations teams? Because it seems like you're pulling them towards the middle. So like what, what needs to change on both sides of those for CICD? So like if, if you're talking about continuous integration and continuous delivery being automatically checking and running scripts and testing and, and deploying, right? That's not something I think that infrastructure operations is necessarily used to, right? Whereas whereas development is is more used to that, but they're not used to the deploy side of things where they have to deal with the operations. So I was wondering if, if that's kind of where you're pulling those that's two sides. That's absolutely where I'm pulling them in. And I think that a lot of that has to do with tooling. What tooling are you using? So like for us, we use GitLab CI CD. And if you think about it at its base level, it's a server and it runs a set of scripts. And those set of scripts are defined by the developer. So for our two Rails applications, I built a, C- a GitLab CI/CD YAML file, and I said, "Hey, these are the tests, which are Ru- it's Ruby. It, the tests are Ruby code, so it's just like running a Ruby code from you know my computer or whatever. I'm responsible for setting up an environment. Luckily, I'm familiar enough with Docker where it's I set up my own environment, and I run the tests in this GitLab CI/CD environment, and then from there." So I'm able to test and then build an artifact. And then with the artifact, I'm able to hand the artifact over to the ops team essentially and say, hey, this is the newest one. It's right here. We know this is going to run. We have everything's already predefined. I can just hand it over to them and they say, okay, perfect. We already have our system of the way we manage our, you know, with Kubernetes or with our Docker environment. You hand it over and they say, okay, perfect. We have what we need to run this container. That's runtime. So I, I, I think... I think you kind of you you hit on the middle right there where you're handing over your artifact to the operations team where they they start running it right where they put it into to, to production and that's where probably they would they would take over and they would start running their scripts to do the deploys and spin up the infrastructure that's necessary right and I think the better you get at DevOps the more that handover is coded right uh, especially with with tests so like like in your CI/CD pipeline if you were to have a continuous integration that flowed into continuous delivery as it's, it's almost like what, what's that thing where you like approach infinity but never quite touch or whatever you know you have these two asymptotic lines that that come close so yeah what it, what it looks like when those are are at their peak where they are just as close together as they can be right is where you have your build process where you're building the artifact you're testing the process you're you know you're running your your ruby integration tests and then either the CICD pipeline uh, kicks off a deployment right or the deployment picks that up and and you have a a seamless flow into deploying that onto infrastructure and infrastructure handles itself where it deploys to dev and does sanity checks and it deploys to you know testing or staging environment and it does those integration tests and then it deploys to production right that's what a a fully fully integrated flow looks like however when you have continuous integration from the developer side meaning continuous delivery from the operation side the closer those are able to meet the better the the more well off you're able to to be that you know as far as a stability uh, standpoint is concerned and I, and I think that's really where where you need to pull these two teams in towards each other yeah and I'd even say we're getting pretty close to that because we have we we absolutely have our uh, uh, what is it our get version script that's out there that checks for new tags and usually when I tag it uh, it I don't know if you're picking it up right now or if we have that set up. Right now, I think I've been uh, manually updating the uh, role based on updated tags, but I think we it, we're we're not far off from getting that continuous delivery. Like, oh, hey, by the way, there's a new version of the two applications we've been developing, where the the handoff is almost seamless. But like me as an operations person would work with you as like a developer person, right? In order for we have your... to get there. We have your testing pipeline. Right. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we're, right. we, we're both kind of we're walking towards that middle where that handoff becomes more and more automated. Right. Whereas right now you create the artifact, which is the Docker image. And then what I have and maintain uh, spins up the infrastructure and, and does its tests. Right. Uh, the, the closer you get that into one pipeline is the closer you get to DevOps. Now, 
question for you, do we ever get to DevOps? Or is it is it, it you know is it like getting to Nirvana where it's like kind of continual like or or like is there a definitive cutoff where like you are DevOps now congratulations? I wouldn't even call it that. I just think DevOps is now a funny word for managing how uh, developers and developer development teams and operations teams interact. It, I I don't know. I, it's a it's a funny metal is what it is because the way you think about infrastructure now is a lot different than handing over it it's a more seamless handoff and you can think of the wall of the you know development team being on one time on one side and the operations team being on the other and i think what you kind of get is well maybe both teams have a ladder and they just meet at the top now and i think i'd almost even put it at that or you know we have an ele we both have elevators and we just meet at the top and you know you're still handing off an artifact to them, but you're not, the development team isn't really chucking it over and saying, yeah, no, this is, this is it. Good. Like in the ops team going, well, wait, aren't there like, isn't there a bunch of parameters and stuff we need? Well, yeah, there is, but it's all, you know, it's somewhere. So I, I think you're just getting closer to a more seamless handoff is what I'd call it. I got a few other things here. I, I want to cover one word velocity. There you go. That's all. That's what, DevOps is focused on. I don't know if that's middle management pushing uh, people to just write more code or. Well, we were we were talking about velocity when it came to having more hands testing the scripts through the same endpoint, right? So we're talking about the, we're talking about how these these scripts get tested. If uh, in an automation front end, right? We have we have both automated processes and humans going in and and running the same automation, right? right? Which is giving us a lot of testing, which means we can have no. incremental change okay. through this to to add your velocity instead of dropping one thing over the wall, you know, keeping right. with the wall analogy, right. you keep tossing a little thing you, right. right. you build up that muscle memory. You're like, okay, right. yeah, I got this now. I, I can do this. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I call it weird, but it's not dev QA ops. So I think it's it's a DevOps, so maybe it, part of it is just automating away that QA that QA step, and making you know automating the tests and automating everything where you don't have to hand it to a QA engineer because the development team said yeah well, I mean obviously it's good practice to have someone look over the shoulder and run this stuff, but maybe development is development teams are coming to that point where they're starting to think also as you know a QA team would, and automate those tests. Well, and, and that's where uh, operations would meet as well. I mean, they, they need, do you have the right pseudo roles? You know, can right. you run this thing? Can, you know, do you have the right users? Is the, is it on the right VLAN? You know, that, that whole good stuff. Yeah. So I put some problems with uh, velocity. Uh, I'm not even going to go, I'm not even going to bother reading them. Uh, the one thing I will note is another uh, buzzword bingo. If you want to mark your board tech debt, I don't know call it a buzzword, call it buzzword, call it whatever you want. It's real. It There's no doubt it's real. If you let this stuff collect, it will come back to haunt you. Uh, luckily, we haven't had anything right now that I want to say has come back to bite us. But if the focus is on just pushing out code, people are just going to write crap and ship it. There's no doubt that's going to end up happening. People aren't going to think about systems. They're just going to focus on, well, we can get it for one user. Does it scale to 10? No, but push it out anyway. You know, you just keep ignoring it and you're like, okay, it's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. And then eventually you run into the problem where it's like, oh, well, it's taking, a, we're running into problems that we shouldn't be running into because we neglected issues that were occurring, but we didn't pay attention to or didn't focus on, didn't address, didn't think about addressing. Well, then how would you handle the dichotomy, it seems, of velocity and tech debt? Like besides documentation, like documentation is, is one way to mitigate that, I think. Um, because having good documentation means that, okay, yeah, I, we, I'm not going to sit this... here. Yeah, I, I know exactly where you're going, but I don't know if yeah. it's sit down and having planning meetings, but it is, you know, maybe getting a second opinion saying, Hey, is this, is if we do it this way, what's, what are they, what's down the road? What's this going to look like? So I, I think a lot of the temptation comes when, when after something is implemented, say, say a, a script is written and it kind of just works. Right. However, it works under the perfect conditions. Right. <laughs> uh, would you would you call that tech debt where 
where it, it has some caveats that aren't necessarily required, where, where you can go up and kind of clean it up so it's a little bit more robust, maybe it has better air handling, uh, stuff like that. Right, obviously, it, it, every, you, can't, you can't look at it in a vacuum because it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's easy. It's very easy to say I want to work on new feature X rather than look at, you know, code base Y that works. But you know, we could do some refactoring here or there. And obviously, everyone wants to focus on the shiny new toy or the shiny new thing, versus you know going back and refactoring. But is it a necessary step? I'd say yeah. I would say you should go back. But if it's something that's, you kind of have to evaluate it for yourself. If is this something I need to go back? Is this something we use? a lot and i need to really go back and maintain or is this you know a script we wrote one time that we run once a year to do you know some task yeah, so, that, that so, isn't really important or you know well well devops has a jingle has a phrase has a term does it follow uh, Agile, something similar to the Agile Manifesto well, or something? Well, yeah. Oh, it has a, so DevOps has a mantra of people, processes, and tools. Okay. Right? Okay. So that's, if if you're talking about tech debt, right, you're not really talking about people, especially if they're already in the mindset of, you know, this is how we need to move as an organization or or, or we need to start thinking about this. And and you're not going to have a tooling discussion because that's, that's going to be, that's going to come near the beginning of when you start your journey towards DevOps. Right. right. But as you get further into developing this mindset and, and this this work thing, how would you just just brainstorm in here, yeah. right? So like how would you build into the process the ability to avoid tech debt? Like what what would cause tech debt and, and how can you build a process around it? So well, so tech debt is, is is almost saying it's being lazy, right? Is it's it's kind of a, a nice way to say, we were lazy implementing this. We built this for right for now. Yeah, we built this for right now. Yeah, yeah. We we didn't necessarily set this up, or or it's going to take a lot of work to maintain. Right? right. You know, there's a lot of manual processes that could be a lot of tech debt. Um, there could be tech debt in that you know it's it's very fragile. It only works these days a week, or yeah. you know you have to run it at a certain location or a certain time. Um, you know, so so. Tech debt on almost understood as as stuff that would almost little gotchas that'll pop up and cause a a, a mountain of manual effort to right. to fix, especially that as it keeps building up, you right. you start putting out little fires everywhere, and then you can't focus on the new thing because all these little fires keep popping up, and that's your tech debt coming back to bite you. And it doesn't hurt at first. I mean, you know, the first time it's like, oh, you know, I grab my water bottle, I was like. Okay, that's that's good, right? That took me five minutes, uh, and then it turns into half your week is dealing with these manual processes that have just built up over time. Right, right. And so, how do you how would you architect a DevOps process to catch that, right, and and prevent that from happening in the first place? Obviously, I, I don't know. I think it'd be a culture thing. So, like we have, I'd bring up the example for us is that we have a lot of tasks and maintenance, and. Granted, those tasks that we have in our maintenance workflow, or at least what we have right now, are stuff we have to act. We, you know, we have to sit down and record a podcast. We have to do some of that stuff. But if you look at some of the tasks we have out there, a lot of them we can automate. They just haven't been automated. And maybe you sit down and you have to write a script, and it's, you know, I, I always like to jump back to that complexity thing, which, well, it's one complexity today and it's one complexity next week. In 50, you know, in 52 weeks, I'll spend 52 complexity doing this over the course of the year. It's like, well, what if I sit down right now and spend 13 or even heck 21 to write a script and it's every week I don't have to worry about doing that manual task that might take an hour to do. I can write that script and it's there and my manual, my, my, ta my maintenance task is I spent time on it up front to get it working, but I don't have to worry about it now for the rest of the year or for the rest of time even. Obviously, I, I do point to culture because I think that's the one way to solve it. It's a continuously question, you know, continuously saying, all right, what can we make better in the organization? What what, what little fire do we have today that we can get rid of by, autom you know, get rid of by automating or get rid of by nipping in the bud and saying, all right, well, the fire is here. I'm not going to let it get to an ember so it can catch back on fire. I'm going to put it out and I'm really going to, you know, I'm going to pour a bucket on it. I want to drill down into that 
those maintenance tasks thing because we we do we we, we track our maintenance tasks as we do them so i have a uh once a month i i redeploy uh, all the the environments that we have deployed um, and that's just part of, of what we do uh and that's something that takes me sitting down you know one day out of the month for you know an hour or two and looking up you know parameters and, and passing them into to run deck to run right um and that's something that could absolutely be automated put on a schedule or, or whatnot but we wouldn't be tracking that if we didn't track it right so ah uh, okay so you're talking about a little shadow it here is that what you're kind of saying yeah, because I and and I have one of my coworkers who I love dearly, but he is terrible with this because he just has little little fires he puts out, you know, every week, almost sometimes every day, right? That nobody knows about, right? That he just goes in and does because it's little. Uh, well, sure. I'll get to it, you know, I'll get to automate it sometime, right? Sure. So, you need to you need to track that work, right? Because if if you don't track that work, then you're never going to understand what's eating up all your time you know where so as as part of that that culture as part of that you know you you got you got to kind of track what you're doing manually right so you got to you got to first recognize that oh this does look like tech debt right and and probably the easiest way to do that is i think like we have where we say okay this is something in our maintenance swim lane that's reoccurring that happens you know once a week or you know once a month and then we we acknowledge that first off we say okay yeah, <laughs> this is something we got to do, yeah. right? And and then we do it. And and that's the thing, too. We, al- we also do it. It's not like we try to automate it first, right? Some things are okay to just do manually for a while. Right, absolutely. Because if you try to automate all the stuff all at once... You're in no time. You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to be sitting, you know... What could have been done in an hour you're spending 14 on and you're, you know, maybe it's a test that only happens twice. Yes. Yeah. So, so you're sitting down there and you're like, okay, so, so now I've, I've done this thing over and over, right? I've, I've been tracking myself doing it. Um, and then we get to your point where you start being able to justify it. You're like, all right, well, this, this does actually take time out of my day that I could be spending on other things, right? So if I'm able to get rid of this, I have a definitive amount of of time savings that I can demonstrate that is that is demonstrably uh, going to going to make me more productive or, or give me time to do other things. So you're you're able to uh, track it and and you know as as you do things manually over and over. I, I I say that's the best way to start on your automation journey because you got to do things over and over before you understand how to automate them, right? So you do them over and over. Next thing is you track it. You say, okay, well, I'm doing this thing over and over, and and you start estimating. Well, it's taking me, you know, an hour a week, right? And so that's an hour out of my week that I'm doing this thing over and over again. And then you start to sit down and say, okay, so this will save me, you know, one hour a week, four hours a month. And you sit down and say, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm carving time out of my day for other things, and and I'm prioritizing this. Because this will save me X, right? This this is right. something that we can get rid of, right? So so you have that tech debt, you you recognize that tech debt, and and I think that's probably the hardest thing too is is trying to narrow down that tech when, debt. Yeah, how do I identify it? That's a that's a that's a big component of it, right? Yeah, uh, you you can also probably do this with incidents too. So like. If you have a ticketing system or if, like us, you just use a, a different swim lane for incidents, you track those and say, well, I've had, you know, 17 of the same type of incident happen. Let me see if I can formulate an automated response when this happens. Right. And then you you, you start looking into, uh, well, what is the expertise that I've gathered while doing this, right? How much is this taking me? And is it worth it for me to automate this, right? And then you start automating your way out of tech debt. Um, either that or going back and, you know, sometimes it's not automating it. Sometimes it's going back and and sucking it up and saying, okay, this code wasn't as good as it could have been. And if, if you're that honest with yourself, you can sit down and say, okay, let me... Let me humble my my pride a little bit and and make some changes to this and and see if that helps. Um, there's one more thing 
about tech debt that I think is is an integral part of this. And I, and I think this is something we've left out of the DevOps workflow uh, for, for the most part is having more eyes on the processes, right? It's being subject to peer review or, or just different communications between people, right? Obviously that that's a more people aspect of it, but like, having having code reviews or, or at least having reviewers someone to look at and you, you say hey I'm, I'm doing this right first of all if you make known what your your work actually entails someone can say whoa, whoa, whoa put the brakes on there we don't actually need that to happen right or that is way too soon for that or I thought you were doing this can I help you I thought I, I didn't know this was taking up so much of your time let's make sure this gets done and have more people or, or whatever you need more hours that you can dedicate to that right so getting more eyes on what everyone is doing kind of being more open and that's scary for people too that is very scary people don't want to be scrutinized for what they what they wrote they just want it to be the black box that hey look at this it works it's like whoa wait we all want to look at that you know and and not in a critical type way and I think that's that's going to be a, a temptation. Right, and that's got to be the, uh, I guess, the switch, if you want to call it, the uh, change there, that it's it's not in a critical, t- you know, we're not poking at it saying, this is the worst piece of garbage I've ever seen in my <laughs> entire existence as a sysadmin or developer, but more to look at it and say, all right, well, it does some things right, but here, here's what it, here's where we can go with it. Exactly. Yeah. Or, and, and it's, it's hard not to take that as, well, you didn't do good enough or right, your right. stuff's broken, right? right? It's, it's hard not to take that personally. And I think it's, it's a maturation process to say, all right, okay, something's not going as you, you know, necessarily expected it. Let's sit down as adults and talk about it and, and right. see if there's something that we as a team or, or collaboratively can do better. So, yeah, I think I think there's a lot that you can do to address that that tech debt um, that that does have a lot to do with with culture and, you know, kind of being more open, being more vulnerable. And that that makes people nervous. Sometimes you have to ship code that's a little broken right. because in, in order to get something off the ground, it, it can't be perfect. You're, you're never going to have it perfect. So stop trying. Get something out there, you know, and, and that's part of. Uh, one of the, the, the rules of open source, especially of the Linux kernel development, where, you know, release early, you know, and release often, you know, get get it out there so that you can make improvements on it. And that's that's going towards your velocity as well. So and, and those those decisions aren't bad, but those decisions may have been necessary, but can also be revisited. Yeah, I I, I don't have anything else to add. It's. Honestly, when, when people are asking for DevOps, usually they're talking about they want site reliability engineers, right? They want they want people who know the operations side of things that can take the developers' artifacts and deploy them, right? And I, I think that this is just a way to put more on the operations teams uh, rather than the, the application teams because they, they just want to be away in their little hole on their development machines, you know, typing away sure. and works for me on my machine kind of thing. Um, whereas if you really want it to work in the real world, you're, you're going to have to have the developers taking some ownership of how their application is deployed. And, and I think that that really, and, and like I said, I'm biased, but I think that's where the DevOps culture needs to keep pushing on developers to, to use these CID, CD pipelines. It's not right. just CI, right? It's not just this continuing integration. You have to keep continually deploying. And then me, as an SRE or as an operations person, I can focus on my monitoring. I can focus on my my templating of, of the infrastructure in order so that when something in your pipeline goes wrong, it's easier for me to get in there, notice it immediately, get in there and fix, uh, rather than trying to handcraft these servers uh, to to have these custom bespoke deployments on so going going back to you know to to wrap this up right um i think we we talked a lot about people process and tools right which is which is what devops is about and 
I think between the two of us, I th- I think we got what it takes to to make the the arrangement between people and process and tools work, right? And there's there's a definite way to do this, and there's a definite way to not. There's a lot of pitfalls to avoid, and there's a lot of things that can really help really anyone who wants to become more productive. And at our Compose, we help groups and communities become more productive by using the open source technologies that we provide. If you're listening to this and, and this is something that you want to work towards, sign up for an instance of our Compose today at rcompose.com and we will help you get there. So, it, and, and with that, you know, I wanted to, to thank everyone for listening to this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks.